My name is Michael Yap. Glad that you guys are here for this session. When I was asked to chair this uh, panel, I was extremely gleeful. Um, I, I thought my panelists were going to have a crazily difficult time uh, to address the issue of understanding Asia audiences. Um, as you know, Asia is probably 60% of the world population. <laughs> and probably about 50 countries. Well, actually, to be precise, about 46 or 7. Um, so obviously, this is a very tough problem. It's about six years ago to this, today, I think, uh, I made a uh, presentation at a tech talk. Um, and, and I argued that there will be an uh, emerging billion user of Asia. At that time, uh, Tencent uh, had 500 million uh, user, And obviously, uh, I underestimated the number of uh, consumers that would come out of Asia. Uh, my deep belief is that Asia will see another billion uh, new user, and obviously, uh, sophist growing sophistication and maturity of the existing user. So I, I think this is a, a crazily amazing uh, topic, and obviously a most difficult topic. Uh, we have here a great set of panelists. Uh, wonderful because uh, they come from different um, spaces, from company like Johnson and Johnson, Google's, and and um, others. Uh, in, in very new startup, uh, for example, API, who is uh, very deep into uh, cross-screen uh, user profiling. So we have a wonderful set of panel today. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to keep it simple. We're going to have the, each of the panelists uh, maybe talk about what they think about this topic, what are the key differences among uh, Asia audiences, uh, what are the unique things about each of the country that they are familiar with, to get a sense of uh, this complex uh, issue that we're dealing with. Uh, they will probably do three, five minutes each, and then we'll open up for some question and answer. I threaten you, if you do not give me any questions, I will hog the whole screen and continue talking. <laughs> so please uh, join me uh, having a, a more interactive session. Please uh, feedback your question, and I'm going to pass. Uh, I'm not going to introduce each of them. They are all on your uh, website, so I'm just going to let them introduce themselves uh, to keep uh, the flow going. So. First of all, once, once again, please help me welcome all my panelists. Fabrizio, you want to start? Thank you, Michael. Uh, my name is uh, Fabrizio. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at AppCare. Just briefly, what we do, we are a te technology company uh, using artificial intelligence uh, to uh, help businesses reach in, uh, consumers online and across green era. In short, we have developed technology that allows us to understand that behind multiple connected devices like a mobile, a PC, or a tablet, there is the same consumer, and also understand a little bit who's this consumer, uh, what kind of uh, profile he has, preferences, and so forth. We are Asia-based. We are active in 11 markets across Asia-Pacific. And because of the nature of the business we run, we have accumulated an, normal, an enormous wealth of data on how people behave uh, in a cross-screen era. Um, we recently published a report, an, an analysis, based on all the activities that we have run in the second half of last year. So it's about 850 billion data points. And um, this analysis has shown some uh, really interesting findings. Uh, the first one is that multi-device is the new norm. So we have seen that 50% of multi-device consumer in Asia use three or four devices. The second one is that uh, um, we have entered what we call the post-mobile era, which is a bit controversial, but what we, mean, what we mean by that. We mean that while mobile is a dominant screen, we see that still people like to uh, use other devices like PC and use all their devices, in fact, in interconnected ways. What that means is that, obviously, for businesses who want to reach this consumer online, it becomes extremely important to have a cross-screen strategy. So if you look further into the data um, and look at, for example, multi-device users, as I said, on average across Asia-Pacific, 51% of multi-device users use three or four devices. It's very, very high. And if you look at more advanced markets like Japan, Korea, Singapore, Australia, the percentage of three or four device users goes up to 70 to 80 percent almost. Mm. And even more aspiring market, like for example Malaysia, is already approaching the 50 percent mark. On the second point, uh, the, uh, the post-mobile era, the cross-screen era, 
We believe that mobile first doesn't necessarily mean mobile only. Uh, we've seen tremendous users in PCs. While the number of smartphones uh, is a lot higher than PCs, six to one on average, we see the PC still accounts for about half, 50% of, of usage. And I think we all familiar, well, most of us probably are familiar with uh, some big e-commerce clients, uh, e-commerce uh, businesses in India that last year tried to go mobile only just to revert back to a sort of full uh, cross-channel strategy a few weeks back. Um, another point of note is that when you look at how people use their devices, there are tremendous differences. And everyone obviously uses their various devices according to their habits and preferences. And there are factors that influence that usage, um, such as, for example, gender, um, time of the day, day of the week. And to our complexity, this, this depends also by market, but it's also by market. For example, male tend to be more active than women mm. on uh, smartphone and PCs. Mm. Uh, if you look at, uh, well, for example, women are more active on tablet for some reason. If you look at different markets, like smartphone usage peaks on Monday in Singapore, midweek in Indonesia, uh, and over the weekend in Taiwan. Mm. Uh, PC usage tends to peak in, during work hours in aspiring markets. But if you look, for example, at Australia, PC usage basically is uh, very high on weekends, for example. Uh -huh. The last point is that we also analyze how people engage uh, with different devices, what kind of content they engage with when they are on different screens. Mm. And we have found something very interesting, mm. that 7 out of 10 cross-screen uh, consumers in Asia have completely different behaviors across the various screens. So as a, as a business or as a brand, when you want to reach to consumers online, it becomes extremely important to have a cross-screen strategy to understand who's that consumer behind the screen. Because whether I use one or two or three screen, I'm still the same person. And being able to, therefore, uh, communicate effectively with, with that consumer. For clients that work with us, they've, they've embraced this cross-screen uh, strategy. They have seen 26% uplift in performance average across all our clients in Asia Pacific. Thank you, Fabrizio. Wimpy? Thank you, Fabrizio. Hi, my name is Wimpy Diokdokoto, and I, um, I'm the CEO of Water and Oxford, which is a platform that I use for investment and advisory. I um, help a range of different startups and companies expand their businesses all around the world. Um, and I've got a range of different uh, startups and companies that I mentor, uh, invest, and advise in. From um, uh, there's today, there's uh, some of them from like visual search through to uh, virtual reality, through to um, different a range of different apps and applications, etc. Mm. So there's roughly um, move, move, pro probably moving towards the triple digit figures right now, uh, you know, nearing a hundred or so of d different startups and companies that I advise, mentor, mm. and invest in. Um, whereas Fabrizio has gone dive deep into, uh, in, into the topic. I just wanted to give you a, just a macro view of, uh, of, of Asia generally and then its consumers. Um, and the word that I like to use, um, well, the anti-word that I use is that uh, Asia is not homogenous. We like to lump Asia as just one sort of uh, word or one sort of description of a type of people belonging to a geography you know, to a particular geography in this world, but Asians themselves are not homogenous. And the way they live their lives is completely different. How a person in, um, uh, uh, how, how a person uh, in Thailand, for example, uh, wakes up and has breakfast is going to be completely different to how a person in India or in, uh, in Tokyo or in Jakarta wakes up and has breakfast uh, um, and, and the media uh, that they consume, etc. So it's completely uh, different and diverse in that sort of way also. Our decisions are driven by our values. For example, um, we go to Indonesia, which is a majority Muslim market, right? And so they are driven by Sharia. There's, there's an emergence of Sharia compliance, such as when it comes to banking and hotels, down to food. Um, clothing, etc. So there are, there are things that are haram and halal and legal and not legal within the Islamic world. Um, you know, wh when, whether it comes to clothes and do you expose your hair, do you not? Do you eat gelatine? Do you not eat gelatine? Do you eat pork? Do you not eat pork? So those things drive consumption behaviors. 
The next thing also is that when we look at it from a religious standpoint, there we have Indonesia, which is a majority Muslim market, but then you go up north a bit to the Philippines, and then the Philippines is a predominantly, whereas Indonesia is about 90% Muslim, then the Philippines is about 85% or so Roman Catholic. Um, that, that's, that's the dominant religion there. And then after that, you go um, west a bit, and you, then you go towards, um, uh, towards Thailand, and that's about 80, 80 85%. Buddhist or so. So religion does drive a lot of consumption behaviors in this particular region. The next part also is um, uh, the, the whole sort of millennial, the age, the, the ages of this particular region. And Asia has a very, it's very opposite population pyramid to what the West is, in that there is a very huge um, what you would call basic pyramid or huge uh, millennial and young population. And so that population is a population that centrally asks the question, why? Why are we doing something? Why are we purchasing something? Why should I take on that job? Why should I invest my life or my time in terms of, or, you know, or, or my money into, in, in that brand? So the questions that brands now must ask is how they address those big whys that the millennials are asking. Because they're a lot smarter and they ask different questions to what you know, somebody my generation asks. So that's another factor when it comes to, uh, to, this, particular, um, uh, to this particular market. The next thing also is that it is economically diverse. Asia is very economically diverse. You get a country like Singapore that has come from 50 years ago, a GDP per capita of US $3,000 to 50 years later to today, and the, US, and the GDP per capita is $83,000. That's not even a plus, that's not even a multiple, that's a huge giant leap for mankind, I would say. And so you get a, com a country like Singapore, which is w the GDP per capita in Singapore is higher than Canada as well as the United States. Now you compare that to Laos as well as Myanmar, and you can't even, there, there, there's, it, it's, a, it's a lost battle there. And then when you get now, which is the, uh, um, the Asian economic, um, the ASEAN economic community, which is going to be a very similar block to the European Union, and you look at the comparisons there, whereas, for example, France and the Netherlands can be quite comparable to the UK, you have ASEAN here with Indonesia, which is part of the G20, which is the group of 20 most powerful economies, versus a country like Myanmar, which is right now just coming out of isolation. So there are those, everything from like economic differentials, there are, um, geo, uh, there are religious differentials, there are also um, age differentials. And another key factor also for, um, for, from an Asian overview standpoint is that Asians are very value-driven, um, it's, it's, it's a very values-driven economy um, where a lot of our principles drive our, uh, our, our, our purchases and our different behaviors and what we are taught as children because it is a economy that is driven by KOLs, which are key opinion leaders. So key opinion leaders here range from our parents and our families, which drive our decisions, as well as to celebrities and, and people who are powerful and who have strong voices in our, um, across whether it's technology, whether it's food, whether it's finance, whether it's fashion. We are an economy that is driven by KOLs. So I just wanted to give you a bit of a, that macro view on top of you know, Fabrizio's deep dive, and I'll just pass it on to, um, to yourself now. Oh, thanks, Wampi. Um, mm. My name's Ryan O'Donnell. I'm uh, the head of digital at um, Johnson & Johnson for our APAC OTC business, OTC's over-the-counter drugs. Uh, you might have heard of Zyrtec, Benadryl, Nicorette, um, Benelin Sinutab, there's a number. We've got about 19 brands in about 15 countries that I'm overseeing at the moment. Um, and I think just to build on what, what these two have been saying and to cut it a different way, the Asian consumer, we have about 4 billion consumers, uh, 4 billion people in APAC. To put the marketing lens over, we have about 3.7 billion mobile phone subscriptions, <laughs> about 1.5 billion uh, internet users and, and rising. And uh, 
about half of the world's smartphones sitting, sitting in this region, and a huge amount of the population sitting in that 15 to 29 space, the, the, the millennial. So to, to put it that way through a marketing lens, you're right, the, the millennials are the ones that are actually driving the conversation. And, and, and because of the fact that we have such a young audience in this part of the world, they are the ones that are shaping the trends. They are the ones that are shaping all of the innovations that are coming through. And as a marketer, as a, as a, as a digital marketer, we're now seeing the biggest growth coming through um, instant messaging. It, it, it's a different from, from social media, from mainstream marketing. Instant messaging is becoming now um, the remote control of the millennials' lives. There, there's very little that you cannot do on all or at least one of the, the messaging apps that are predominant across Asia. So uh, WeChat, for example, you have the ability to be able, the, the Shanghai government has been able to create an account where you can do anything from paying your bills to booking a hospital appointment to seeing a doctor. Um, there's very little that you cannot do. Uh, Food Panda in Singapore, uh, and other ASEAN markets um, allow you to buy your food to, to be able to have home delivery food through the WeChat app. Um, in Korea, Line and Japan, Line is obviously a massive platform. I know that Burberry partnered with them last year to be able to uh, broadcast live their spring summer fashion collection so that anyone online could be there in the now with the brand. And then um, I guess for WhatsApp as well. In India recently, I understand that the Delhi Police Department now has a number where any, um, any uh, person in, in the city has the ability to be able to, um, or for want of a word, better word, dob in a, uh, a policeman that isn't actually doing their job properly just by sending a WhatsApp message to a particular, um, to a particular phone number. So from, from, a, from a trends that are shaping Asia perspective in that millennial generation, it is definitely coming to a mobile first and a very personalized, yep. um, very personalized experience. I think the, the second part for, for millennials and what's becoming very clear is peer-to-peer. -peer. And, and I know that this, if, if, if you've come from a Western market, this isn't, um, this isn't new news, but it's happened so fast in, in Asia. That it's, very, um, that it's becoming so predominant. And I, I speak, for example, about the blurring lines between e-commerce and, and online in a way that a consumer that might have been going to a wet market to buy their food six years ago has moved very quickly for, into a hypermarket and now to home delivery through online in maybe six years. And that's, a, that's an enormous acceleration that has been taken advantage of. Um, in markets such as Thailand, you have a, a, a an app called Parking Duck, which gives people the ability to be able to share their parking spaces with all of the people that are coming into Bangkok on a daily basis. I think there's a discrepancy of about five, billion, five million cars going through um, uh, Thailand at any particular time with only 400,000 spaces. So these kinds of apps are very important. Um, Gotta Go, which is a, a toilet app, allows people to be able to, in different parts of, um, Southeast Asia be able to find a toilet in close proximity. And so effectively, it's a marketplace that's becoming available, again, through people's mobile phones, connecting other people. So I think that's a really important point. Um, I think that the, the consumer, I think, as you're saying, they're, they've gone from being a, I want what I want, when I want it, and that soon, as marketing companies and brands start becoming more personalized and have the ability to understand the data of each consumer will be, I want what I want when I, as, as opposed to when I want it, I want what I want when I need it, and then maybe a bit further down the line it'll be, um, I want what I want before I even know that I need it. And, and I think that's where we're trying to get to it as brands um, to be able to engage with this consumer. So I think that's probably the lens that I'd put that on there, Sergio. Thank you, very right. Thank you very much, you. Ryan. So um, I'm going to keep it short so we can actually start the, the actual discussion. But my <coughs> name is Sergio Salvador, and I work for Google. Um, I focus on partnerships on uh, gaming and mobile. Um, mobile, of course, being a, a key component of that. Um, I have been in this part of the, I'm Spanish, but I've been in this part of the world for around 11 years now. A couple of uh, the first two years in Hong Kong, then eight years in Singapore. And I moved last year to Tokyo to be closer to the big businesses and the big markets of uh, North Asia. Hopefully one day I will make my way back to Singapore, but for the moment Tokyo is what I call home. Um, I'm going to sort of um, uh, add the, my own point to the discussion and also start sort of pushing back as well on some of the comments that my co-panelists made today. 
Um, and one of the things I would like to make an emphasis on or, or posit is that there is one single factor that has turned Asia Pacific already into the largest global retail market. There is one single factor. And that single factor is the mobile phone, the smartphone specifically. Um, what I think we are witnessing is um, a revolution. And that revolution started a few years ago. And Asia at that point was essentially the recipient of the benefits of something that was happening in other parts of the world. What we are seeing nowadays is that thanks to the mobile phone and thanks to the, uh, to the fact that we have 1.4 billion smartphones in Asia Pacific as of this year, we're seeing that Asia is not content, is not happy with receiving the benefits of what is going on in other parts of the world. Asia has started to drive innovation as well on the mobile phone, on the smartphone market. And that means innovation at a lot of different levels. We see companies like Xiaomi being number three, number two globally in terms of number of users, even technology. Um, we see Apple that launched the iPhone a couple of years in, uh, ago in China. Actually, the, the amount of iPhones that they are selling at the moment is declining because Chinese consumers, the, 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 the taste of Chinese consumers is very fickle. It moves very fast, and they always want to differentiate themselves. They want to feel unique. And therefore, when everybody around you has an iPhone, they don't want to have an iPhone. We see innovation in platforms like uh, you were talking about WeChat, Ryan. You were talking about WeChat, Kakao Talk Line. But also things like uh, Hike in India or uh, Zig in, um, out of Vietnam, for example. Um, and I think this also shows that the next decades are going to be the, the decades of Asia. Now, all of this is happening, in my opinion, because uh, as, as smartphones have happened and because Asia has taken the reins in driving the smartphone revolution. A great example of, of that is the fact that currently uh, the number one country in the world in terms of um, in, in, penetration of smartphones is China. But this year, India is expected to surpass the US in terms of penetration of smartphones. China and India are both are not just the largest countries in the world, but the ones that are going to define what an internet experience is going to be in the future based on mobile. So one thing that I, have, um, I want to make an emphasis on as well is the fact that, um, in a sense, and I may disagree with you a little bit, Fabrizio, on this, right? In a sense, in many countries, for many consumers, mobile is the only way they access the internet. Mm. It doesn't happen everywhere, and there is a multi-device strategy that companies like yours definitely have to follow. But in many cases, like Myanmar, for example, the majority of the population have never even seen a computer. Right? Their only means of accessing the internet is a mobile phone. And what they consider an internet experience at this point in time, because of the level of education and the level of access to the new technologies, may actually mean that they consider Facebook the internet. And in the case of Myanmar, they consider e Gmail as the email experience. Right? And this has to do with the level of education, but it also has to send a message to many companies, right? That in order to understand the Asian consumer and work with the Asian consumer, uh, it's important to understand how they view the world. And they view the world through one single lens, and that is the lens of a smartphone. In a sense as well, smartphones have created something which is very interesting, which is the democratization of access to information. That person I was talking about in Vietnam that sees the world through a single lens, today is lucky enough to have the same access to information, to the same amount of information, as someone in the US who has access to the internet for decades. Yeah. Right? That smartphone is the equivalent of any other device that accesses in the internet in the US and gives them the same access to information. It's a very powerful thing that is going to shape how those consumers in Asia view, view the world. Um, just one final thing from my perspective, um, from my side, and this is that um, what we are experiencing is that consumers, or, or that behaviors of consumers are influenced by the device they use, and not necessarily the other way around. Um, having said that, I will pass it back to Michael, so yes. we can go for questions. Thank you. Um, there's a bunch of questions that's come in. Uh, the first one I've chosen is in front of you. Um, I suggest that um, whomever feel comfortable in taking it, please uh, just proceed. Um, while you guys are looking at that question over there, okay. uh, it's on the screen as well. Uh, I would like to add a question for you guys to think about. Uh, if there's one advice, just one, from each of you to a startup out here, many of them are, when they're expanding into Asia, what would that be in terms of uh, addressing the uh, audience of Asia? 
So anyway, uh, the first question is over there. The three trends um, that you see uh, will be unfolding in Singapore. Anybody will? Okay. So uh, I, I think <laughs> in uh, Singapore, obviously, it's a very <laughs> developed market in Asia. I mean, if you look back, um, probably you know, ten years ago, the interaction, um, especially online interaction, we very many to people going online was through one screen which was the PC. Today already we have PC, we have tablets, we have smartphones. Um, you're starting to see uh, people working around with smartwatches, um, uh, Google Glasses, or whatever is going to come after that. Um, and I believe that uh, this trend will be here to stay, continue. I personally think in five, at least in, I would say in 10 years completely, I don't think we can actually say how people will engage. I think there will be completely new way of people to engage. Uh, with content and services. Um, it could be that screens, this wall will become screen that people can interact with. There could be all the other ways. What that means for businesses uh, is, again, going back to what I was saying before, is extremely important to understand who's the person behind all these interaction points. Uh, I think today, especially uh, when it comes to reaching consumer, especially for advertising purposes, there is a, a trend to, to talk to devices, to hardware, as opposed to people. Um, so um, I think that's what, what's going to happen. I think that's a great question, but let me just say that Singapore is not the mirror of Asia. Singapore is the anomaly of Asia. Singapore is more connected to Switzerland and London than it is to places in India and Indonesia and all these places. So, um, so I, I just wanted to also build on the, a, a particular point of yours is that technology has the power to democratize the world. And so that lens that that person in London, uh, the, the same lens that that person has in London is the same lens that that person has in Singapore. So technology has the power to democratize the world. But then possibly, and this is what I'm really hoping for Singapore as the leader of Asia, as well as Japan and South Korea, is that there are different stages and phases of innovation in this world. And the first stage is importation, where you're importing a lot of technology and ideas. That's where Indonesia is at right now, right? Where we're importing a lot of our heavy technologies from screens to TVs to cars to ships to boats to planes to everything. Everything is being imported. The next level above importation is, in a, uh, sorry, is imitation, which is a lot where China is at right now, right? For example, WeChat was based on trying to um, replicate and copy a lot of Facebook messages and a lot of other sort of messaging platforms around the world, right? Um, and Apple launches the iPad and then China launches the YPad of sorts, right? And so that is the imitation level. And so the next level above that is the innovation level. And innovation does not come every day. It comes every number of years. And that's when you add true value to the world. You're creating new value to the world. You're building incrementally on what was previously at the forefront of that technology. And then only on top of innovation is invention. And invention is something that completely disrupts the world and changes the course of history and changes the course of the future. Asia, as I was saying, is not homogenous from an innovation and from an in that sort of intellectual and technology development standpoint. Most of Asia is at importation. Lucky if where many of us are at that imitation level. But I'm hoping that the next few years, over the next few years over at Singapore and Asia's leading markets such as Japan and Korea, that there could possibly be a great invention that will change the course of the history of the world. Anybody else want to take that question or we move on to the next question? I do have a, a small addition um, on, on the point about where Singapore will be. I, I suspect that uh, Singapore will use technology uh, in deepening uh, various sector usage. This has always been, uh, uh, Singapore has been a lot better at, at the application in, in specific sectorial use than consumer leading. So I got the feeling that uh, uh, the technology uh, might be moved into a lot more into sector specific usage. Anyway, um, there's another interesting question out here. Um, are freebies good for brand building? I think we must ask Google for that. <laughs> And Johnson and Johnson, obviously. 
I, 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 I Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> one, of, one of the big themes around uh, data sharing as a brand with the consumer is about reciprocity. So I think if, if you are gaining data in whatever form, whether it be a name or some preferences or purchase history or, or a willingness of a consumer to be able to give you some, some of their details, then there has to be a reciprocity. Um, and that can come in the form of freebies or a, a, a personalized recommendation or an experience that's much more customized to that person. So um, maybe the good old days of handing out samples. I, I don't know whether that, that's where this is coming from, but I think in the next you know, currently and in the future, reciprocity is a major theme, and, and it'll be uh, in a consumer will give you in line with what you are giving them of value. So, as long as you can keep delivering a great service or product to a consumer, then there's a like, good likelihood that they'll be um, willing to be able to share data with them in order to be able to receive it, which is how, in turn, you become a more relevant brand. So myself, I would argue that it's not just Asians who love free stuff, it's everyone. It's <laughs> <laughs> you can Different get it, why not, right? <laughs> uh, but you know, working for Google and especially focused on the type of business I am, um, you know, Google's business is essentially most of it is giving stuff for free and then finding ways of monetizing it. Currently, it's most of it advertising. But at the same time, there's a growing uh, amount of services that are based on subscription, uh, su subscription which sort of tilts the balance a little bit more in favor of kind of not free stuff. But in, in the world I live in, right, which is um, a lot of kind of mobile gaming and, and mobile apps in general, um, that is the type of business model that is most used at the moment, right? Um, users expect free when they down, download an app. They expect to be able to download a, a fully working demo of whatever they want to try on their smartphones. And then they also expect to a certain extent to be offered certain ways of paying for part of the experience. Um, I think, um, and going back to one of my points before, right, what um, is easy to forget is that this type of business model is actually an Asian invention. Mm. Right? Um, in our purchases on mobile apps and mobile games, uh, started their life essentially as microtransactions in PC online games in Korea around 10 or 15 years ago. And then they made their way to different places. And I'm talking specifically about the digital world, right? Um, and that's a very interesting uh, sort of evolution of business models created by the fact that when uh, non-Asian companies were coming to Asia to sell digital goods on DVDs, consumers, for a number of reasons, were not ready to engage with that business model. Right? And in those days, and even today, in countries like Vietnam, right, for this type of physical media, there are piracy rates of 96 and 97%. No uh, company can build a sustainable model or sustainable business in the long term based on, based on those numbers. Right? So it's interesting to see that a, a specifically Asian problem develop a specific Asian solution yeah. that to a certain extent has also been exported outside to the world. Right? And I have the impression, and going back to the, to the core of the question, which is, you know, what, I, I believe that whatever teens decide to do nowadays and how they are, their mentality and their behavior is evolving based on the fact that they have access to all of these devices and all, all of mm. this information. It's also going to define uh, what the next revolution or evolution is going to be in the world of kind of, especially yeah. in the world of digital or, or digital engagement and brand loyalty. Right? And hopefully we'll see more solutions that are from APAC, for APAC, but also scalable globally. Well, I, I, I was thinking that maybe it's not about freebies. Uh, Asians might be a bit more skeptical. And I think the, the movement is that you must prove your value and then we will spend. Rather than a freebies, I think. I don't know. That's my feeling that, you know, uh, consumers uh, need to be, because there's so much noise out there and they want to be able to experience it first. So the game is a classical example. You, down, you play for free, if it's good, I will pay for it. Anyway, um, the next question is, um, which is interesting. Um, do you really see Asian uh, being a different set of consumer uh, than the West? Do uh, you think it will evolve to be somewhat different? Uh, it's an interesting uh, question. Anybody uh, would like to take a crack? Um, yeah, so I think uh, so the, the question is about if Asian cons consumer will mimic those in the West. Uh, based on what we observe from our data, at least, we believe that Asian are very, very different. I uh, think, uh, going back to Sergio's point, mobile usage in Asia is by far higher than 
um, than Europe, for example, or even Western world, uh, mobile penetration. And I tend to agree with some of the Sergio's statement, by the way. We are not suggesting that uh, mobile is not important. Mobile uh, is extremely important in Asia. All, all we are saying is that according to our data, mobile first doesn't necessarily mean mobile only. Um, but we see fundamentally that in Asia, consumer behave very, very, very differently. Uh, not just compared to Europe, but also when you look at Asia in itself. So consumers in advanced markets like Singapore, or Australia, or Japan and Korea would behave very differently than consumers, say, in India, in Indonesia, in Myanmar. Um, and I don't see, if, at least for the, for the time being, um, consumer in Asia sort of uh, having similar behavior to, to, to Europeans. Hmm. Anybody else? To add to that? Um, I would just uh, add one small point if that's okay. I think um, I, I haven't seen data around this, but uh, my instinct tells me if there's data around this. L looking at the data and looking at the different kind of demographic groups in different countries globally, I bet we would be finding a significant amount of similarities already mm. uh, between those demographic groups uh, in different countries, West versus Asia. Uh, in terms of some of the behavior, a, a basic one, right? I would bet that a significant amount of uh, the same, per, a similar percentage of those demographic groups in Asia versus the West, the first thing they do in the morning is they look at their phone. Mm. Right? And maybe they check their favorite social network or whatever it is, right? And that is a pattern of behavior that is very interesting to keep in mind, uh, without forgetting the fact that there are also a lot of cultural differences that are going to mm. you know, change thing, how things happen during the day, as Wemby was was referring to earlier today, right? But there's gonna be some interesting similarities that, again, you know, if someone has data that shows that, I would love to see that data. Mm. Well, we, we have a question that's quite popular. Let's address uh, directly at Wempy and Ryan. Um, well, the audience is asking you whether there are any specific tools. Uh... <laughs> um, write a marketing strategy, I think, first start. Um, question. I, I, I think depending on what your objectives are, if we, Asia, like, like Wimpy's saying, it, it's too big a market to be able to homogenize it. I think if you're talking about ASEAN markets, um, ex Singapore, then you're looking at a, the, the, the bottom of the smart pyramid where brands a, a, and products, brands and businesses need to be able to look at less sophisticated um, digital tools to be able to cater for a consumer that doesn't have the same level of internet penetration as Singapore or as some of the North Asian markets have. So how do you um, f create lifestyle solutions using, I guess, less sophisticated uh, platforms, tools, anything that you can use to be able to solve your problem? Um, if you're looking to be a, looking to build a relationship with a consumer in a market with deep internet penetration and mobile rates, then you have, I still think, going back to instant messaging as a, as a, as a way to be able to work your way into what is effectively the remote control of their lives. And that creates relevance, and being on a consumer's phone is the ultimate, um, I guess, the ultimate gesture that you are relevant to their lives. As long as you can stay relevant and they're using you on your phone, then, then you're, you are winning. As soon as you cease to be useful, you will lose relevance and you will leave their phone, and then you are gone from their 100% their on captive uh, audience and platform. So, uh, broad question to a broad answer to a broad question. Can I, um, <laughs> can I just, um, uh, just, just in finality, just add to Ryan's final point about how to capture the Asian market? Um, and I believe that many um, Asian companies or international brands that are trying to launch into Asia are completely doing it the wrong way. I believe that the most important thing that you need to do as a brand, firstly, is to build affinity with the consumer. Build brand affinity with the consumer. So the first thing is to do is to move people's hearts with your product or your service, right? And once you're able to move people's hearts with what you're, who, who you are, why you exist, and how you can add value to their lives, then and only then can you move people's minds with your price and your rationality and everything, all the rational triggers of a person's mind in terms of why they should consume your product. Only once you've moved consumers' hearts and moved consumers' minds, only then can you move their wallets to purchase your products and services. Hmm. Can I just well, add, uh, sorry, please, from sorry. a 
Yeah, also, I, I agree with uh, my co-panelist's views, and I just wanted to add it a little bit more, maybe from a, a technology aspect, as Asians are so diverse, and across Asia, people behave so differently. So the data points, there's a market here you need to take into account when you want to reach and win these consumers are way too many, and that's where I, I believe the technology can play a huge role moving forward. I mean, we see an emergence of, obviously, business analytics, data analytics in the last five years, and that, that kind of technology is becoming more and more prevalent now in marketing. Uh, however, that is really to m analyze fundamentally past behavior. Now we have predictive uh, technology based, for example, machine learning, artificial intelligence, for example, we are using at Appier. Going back to what Ryan was saying at the beginning, you know, giving the consumer something they want, not just now, but even before they want it. So being able to predict the behavior, now there is technology available to do that. And that's where I think uh, data analytics, artificial intelligence will play a huge role. Our time is up. Okay, one last question that you guys promised to deliver to our audience. If there's one practical advice to start up, uh, looking to address Asia consumer, what would that be? Just one, actionable one, please. My, um, my final advice is simply, let me give you an analogy, right? If I was to stand here with a microscope, right, and then walk around Singapore from Siglap to Tanamera to um, Holland Village to Orchard Road with that microscope, nothing will happen. But if I decided to stand at a park at Marina Bay and just sit there with that microscope and focus it on the ground, for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes or so, a fire would start to build. And that is the point of focus. So Asia is a huge market with over 60% of the world's population. If you want to be successful in Asia, you need to have focus. Pick the market that you want to penetrate, survive and thrive at, and go for it, focus. Then move on and move forward not just be everywhere. Have focus and you will thrive. Thank you. Right? Be relevant, stay, stay relevant okay. with your consumer. Did you? Um, find a problem that you have, because it's likely that a lot of other people have the same problem, and figure out the solution on mobile. Mm. Well, for me, is uh, whatever is the business problem you, you're trying to solve, put a user in the center. Whichever dimension you look at it, whether it's how they access content and services, just put them in the center and give them choice. Thank you. Uh, I'll take the opportunity. I think the uh, MC is going to kick us out. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. And thank you for being a great audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.